the reason why there are misconceptions about the kingdom is because of the way that people in general have been taught and theologians specifically have interpreted the Bible. Welcome to the Sound Words Podcast, where it's our goal to help Christians love and live out God's Word. Please subscribe or follow to help us reach more people with biblical content and to stay up to date on the latest episodes. I'm Pastor Aaron Nicholson. I'm with Pastor Jesse Randolph. And today we are going to be discussing a big and important subject, the kingdom of God. To help us do that, we have Dr. Roy Beecham here with us. Welcome to the Sound Words Podcast, Roy. Thank you so much. Good to be with you. It's great to have you. Dr. Beecham is professor of Old Testament courses at Central Baptist Theological Seminary. And Dr. Beecham, starting November 6th, you will be teaching a one-week seminary class titled The Kingdom of God. And so my, my first question for you is, what will this class be about? And could you also explain what is the kingdom of God? Uh, the class is actually based, grounded on a book that was written by Alva J. McLean many years ago. Uh, he was the founder and president of Grace Theological Seminary in Winona Lake, Indiana. Uh, I had this course from uh, my professor, Dr. Alden McCune, back when I was in seminary. And when Dr. McCune moved, that class was assigned to me. It was my favorite class, one of my favorite classes, if not my favorite class in seminary. And it just has been a, a great blessing for me to teach this course for for many years now. It is about uh, exclusively about the kingdom of God. Um, what is the kingdom? What is a kingdom? Uh, McLean defines a kingdom as having three essential components. A ruler who has authority to rule. Uh, a realm which involves regionality and a populace, a, a place and a people, if you would. Uh, that are part of this kingdom, and then rulership. So ruler, realm, and rulership, ruling mm -hmm. actually, the ruler actually ruling over the realm. Mm. Those three elements are important for a kingdom, and the kingdom of God then, of course, involves, generally speaking, the rule of God, and that has a couple of manifestations in Scripture. Mm. That's super helpful, even to think of that, those categories of ruler, rulership, and realm. Yes. And that, that leads into another question we're going to have for you, Dr. Peacham, because we'll hear a lot of people talking about, you know, the kingdom being within you or, or advancing the kingdom or things such as that to just kind of get thrown around as common Christian terminology. So would you be willing to, to shed some light on some common misconceptions that people have about the kingdom of God? Even that one I mentioned from, from Luke 17, where, where there are these words from Jesus about the kingdom um, being within you. How would you address some of those misconceptions? Well, I would say that probably most people today, people in the pews of our evangelical churches, are confused, if not misinformed, about this idea of the kingdom probably because the vast majority of theologians and mm. therefore pastors who studied under them, in my opinion, these theologians and pastors have uh, adopted a view of the kingdom that I believe is, is deficient. Most people today, if you ask them what is the kingdom of God, they would say, well, it's, it's you know God ruling in my heart. When I got saved, I entered the kingdom. It's a spiritual realm that's within me. And uh, often the text that is used is the one that you just cited, uh, where in some translations it says that Jesus replied to the scribes and Pharisees. They were asking about the coming of the kingdom. And Jesus replied to them, the kingdom of God is within you, say some of our translations. Unfortunately, those are poor translations. Uh, the more current translations, I think most of them, the NIV, the New American Standard, the ESV, translate Jesus' words there that the kingdom of God is among you or the kingdom of God is in your midst. Mm -hmm. Jesus was not telling the scribes and Pharisees 
that the kingdom is some ethereal, redefined thing that is now inside of you. Certainly it wasn't inside of the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus is building on a very common concept, both in the ancient Near East and in the scriptures. And that is that, that kings represent, as it were, or embody, as it were, kingdoms. Kings represent kingdoms. When Nebuchadnezzar saw the vision of the head of gold, the chest of silver, and so forth, Daniel related the vision to him, and then he said to Nebuchadnezzar, you, Nebuchadnezzar, are the head of gold. Well, I thought Babylon was the head of gold. Hmm. Well, Babylon is the head of gold, but Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. And there are many other texts I could take you to. Uh, The point is that kings represent kingdoms. And here are the scribes and Pharisees asking Jesus, the Messiah, where the kingdom is. Hmm. And Jesus said, essentially, if I may put words in his mouth, you fools, the kingdom is right in front of you. The king is standing in your midst. So if we properly translate the words of Jesus, Jesus is talking about a kingdom that is very clearly defined in scripture that the scribes and Pharisees very clearly would have known about. They aren't asking Jesus, what's the nature of the kingdom? They're asking if it's here or not. Um, They knew the nature of the kingdom, and Jesus is saying the king is standing right in front of you. If you would recognize that, you would be prepared to receive both me and the kingdom as promised in Scripture. Yeah, that's helpful to look at their understanding because I'm even reminded as you're talking in Acts 1 where they ask uh, the resurrected Jesus, you know, when are you going to set up your kingdom? And he says, it's not for you to know. In other words, they understood they weren't in the kingdom. Just because they knew Christ and they were believers, they understood that this was a physical kingdom that he was going to set up, and they wanted to know when. Right. Those, in fact, were the disciples, as you know, and not the scribes and Pharisees, but the disciples after Jesus' resurrection, certainly in Acts 2, said, is it now time for you to restore the kingdom? And we could talk a lot about that in my class. We eventually will, but... Mm. Here, Jesus had been with them for two and a half, three and a half years. They understood what the kingdom was. Uh, They realized that the kingdom wasn't here yet because the king had been rejected. And now they're asking, okay, now is it time to establish the kingdom? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know. that They had the right view of the kingdom. What they didn't know, uh, what wasn't revealed yet, was the time of its Mm -hmm. coming. And, of course, that was going to be delayed because Jesus had been rejected. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's helpful. And going back to the the subject of the importance of defining the kingdom, the the importance of terms. Jesse, you alluded to the fact that people today use that word all the time. I'm a music guy. It's everywhere in songs. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. we the kingdom, bring your kingdom here. And um, it's it's just one of those Christian words that, that people use and maybe aren't sure of what it means. How does your view of the kingdom impact your day-to-day life? Well, that's a great question. And uh, I could go, let me go a couple different ways on on that. First of all, The reason why there are misconceptions about the kingdom is because of the way that people in general have been taught and theologians specifically have interpreted the Bible. I mean, is the interpretation of the Bible important to my daily life? How do we interpret the Bible? And the key question with regard to the kingdom is, how should we interpret the prophets? The prophets predicted that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem of Judea. Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem of Judea, right? And of course, all theologians believe that. The prophets also prophesied that uh, the kingdom would be rejected, that someday the kingdom would be restored to Israel. I love Micah 4, 8. To you it will come, even the former dominion. Here's where the Here's where the theologians hedge because their theology won't accept the idea of a future Jewish literal kingdom. And so though they interpret some prophecy literally, the ones that have been fulfilled, the rest of the prophets' prophecies about Israel's future, they interpret um, – We used to use the word spiritually. Now it's more common to say typologically. Those – Prophecies about Israel's future and the restoration of the kingdom, those should be interpreted spiritually or or 
you know, ethereally or maybe typologically, the, ch- the church has taken over these promises. And it's not going to be Israel, you know, ruling in Palestine. It's going to be the church ruling the world. So how does this impact my life? Well, first of all, how do we interpret Scripture? All theology comes from exegesis, and all exegesis comes from your hermeneutic. So if you have a faulty hermeneutic, you're going to do incorrect exegesis, which is going to lead to faulty theology. And I believe that our seminaries and our churches are full of faulty theology, especially about the kingdom, many other things, because of a faulty hermeneutic when it comes to the prophets. So if I want to understand what God is saying to me in his word, especially the Old Testament and especially the prophets, I have to have an understanding of how I should take the prophets. And I believe I should take them at face value. We tend to use the term literally. If Bethlehem of Judea is Bethlehem of Judea, then the restoration of the kingdom to Israel is the restoration of the kingdom to Israel. How do we interpret the Bible? Beyond that, um, I'm actually going to be speaking in our church this evening on the forgotten focus of the church, which is the kingdom. The epistles. How, How many times? I'm going to have you guys guess at this number. How many times do you think the word kingdom is used in the epistles to the church? Maybe I'm going to embarrass you. I don't know. Three. (laughs) I'll go four. I believe the number is 18, maybe 17. That was embarrassing. Man. Edit. (laughs) Cut. (laughs) But but see, but but that's my point. You know, we don't think the kingdom is a part of the discussion of the church epistles. It's used uh, well over a dozen times in the epistles, uh, and that's why I call it the forgotten focus of the church. The authors of the epistles, the apostles particularly, tell us that they are living their lives in anticipation of the kingdom. They're going to tell us that we're strangers, we're pilgrims, we're foreigners here, we're ambassadors. This is not our world. We're simply here as ambassadors. Our world, our destiny. Look up the word inheritance in the epistles, which is a reference to the kingdom. More times than the kingdom is mentioned, they speak of our inheritance. They were looking forward to the coming of Jesus and the establishment of the kingdom as prophesied by the promise. That's what they lived for. They said, we have a kingdom hope. We are kingdom citizens. They say we should live kingdom-like lives as ambassadors and strangers in this foreign world, and we have a kingdom message. What is that message? Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. John 3, the gospel, is the gospel of the kingdom. So how does that impact my life? Every day I wake up, I should be thinking first and foremost in my mind that morning. I am anticipating the coming of Jesus and the establishment of the kingdom. And before he comes, I'm an ambassador of that kingdom. I am a citizen of that kingdom, not of this world. And I have a kingdom message. I need to live a kingdom life. And my whole destiny my whole life is driven by and impregnated with and should be lived for the coming kingdom. Hmm. Amen. That is so well said. And you've hit on so many uh, topics there. You know, even even the thought that kingdom being that that central focus, that golden thread that goes throughout scripture, um, agreed, that, that is overlooked. And you, you, the fact that it's the forgotten focus of the church and how it's in the prophets, it's in the, the New Testament, it's in the epistles. You just embarrassed us by, by um, <laughs> indicating how mu- much it actually is. And we haven't even, you know, we, we've underestimated highly how often it is in the, the epistles. Right, right. And it clearly brings you such joy, as you just articulated, to think about the, the coming kingdom of Christ, his reign on the earth, where we will be with him and, and reigning with him in, in, in that way. So what gets you the most excited it brings you the most joy as you think about the future kingdom of god what are some where, where does dr beecham's train of thought go as you think about the coming kingdom of god well a, a couple of things i mean let me just hit the 
theological part before I get to the practical part in my life. God rules over everything all of the time. Adam was told to rule. He messed that up. Israel was told to rule. He messed that up. Jesus is going to come, and he's going to rule for a thousand years. He's going to restore the kingdom to Israel. Israel will be over all the other nations. And what Jesus did by his death, burial, and resurrection is not only redeem those who come to believe in him, save them. He came to deliver the world. He's going to rule and reign for a thousand years over this earth within history. Remember, this is a grand central theme of history. He's going to rule not after history, not just after history. He's going to rule at the end of history. And what Jesus is going to do in that thousand years where he's directly ruling and reigning over this earth, over people in natural bodies, living natural lives with kings and kingdoms, uh, Israel over them, is at the end of that thousand years, Jesus is going to put down all rebellion, all sin. He's going to bring this world, this history, this earth's history back to where it was at the beginning. When God created the earth in, in six days and all that is, and he said, behold, it was very good, perfectly submitted to the expectations, all of the expectations of God. It was very good. It was perfect. But man's sin messed that up. But man's Savior is going to fix it all. And at the end of time, put a big umbrella over the timeline. And at the end of time, Jesus is going to bring this entire universe, mankind, the, the creatures of the air, the creatures of the sea, the stars of the heaven, the trees and the bushes, the entire universe is going to be brought back to complete submission to the Father. And it says in 1 Corinthians 15, when he has brought everything back into submission to the Father, the last enemy to be put down is death. Mm -hmm. The day you eat of the tree, you will die. And the last enemy to be conquered will be death. And when Jesus has brought this earth history back to where it should be, back to where it was at the beginning, it says he will turn the kingdom over to the Father. There will be a new heaven, a new earth. I, I love to shock people with this statement. We are not going to live forever in heaven with God. God is going to live forever with us on earth, the new earth, the eternal phase of the kingdom, after Jesus fixes this earth and its history. That is so exciting to me, <laughs> and that theologically, but practically, the older I get, the more I, I want to get to this point. I look forward as a church age saint to be raptured, to be glorified, to come back with Jesus and rule and reign with him for a thousand years. That's going to be absolutely stupendous. I can't wait to watch that happen. But even more than that, I can't wait till the thousand years are, are over. And Jesus has rectified everything that is broken. And a new heaven and a new earth where all of the redeemed for all time will dwell on earth with God. Trust me, as I fall apart as an old human being in a fallen world, I can't wait to see what the world is really supposed to be like when we have a new heaven and a new earth. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you've, uh, you've ministered to everybody in this room just with the last five minutes of reminding us of where this is all headed and where we'll be and who we'll be worshiping and what he's going to do with everything. And uh, praise the Lord. I can't wait for our audience to hear that and yeah. be ministered to by it. And so comforting rather than this, you know, false picture of, of being in the clouds with a harp and a halo. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a tangible, yeah. we can see Jesus, we can touch him, we can be on the earth with him. And it's very, yeah, like you said, Jesse, it's encouraging to me. I'm officiating at a funeral this Friday, and uh, this is this is where our attention needs to be, is on the coming kingdom of God. Yep. I mean, heaven, heaven is going to be great. To be absent from the body is present with the Lord, mm. but it's only a temporary place. You know, people yeah. say, well, isn't our citizenship in heaven? And if you look at that text in Philippians, maybe you could read that for me. Philippians 3.20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which okay, also... Okay, stop, stop right there. Our citizenship is in heaven. That's where we stop, but now keep reading. Mm. From which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has, even to subject all things to himself. Yep. So our citizenship is in heaven, but it's a temporary holding place. You know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Heaven's going to be a wonderful thing to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. But there we are waiting for the coming of Jesus to restore all things. We aren't going to be in heaven forever with God. God is going to be forever with us on earth when all things are restored. So glory in your heavenly citizenship, but it's a temporary holding place until we get to the real world that God intends for us forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Beecham. We appreciate you coming on the podcast and sharing those words of encouragement, those words of truth with us. Thanks again for coming on. Thank you so much. There's so much more that we could say. We tried to squeeze it in. I just would recommend everyone to study God's kingdom from Genesis to Revelation and imagine, think about what that should mean to you. It's a great blessing. On that topic, Dr. Beecham, would you be willing to give us a couple of recommendations on places, in addition to scripture, um, people can do some reading on the kingdom? Again, the book that changed my life um, in that regard was when I was taught the class on the kingdom of God, basically from the, the book by Alva J. McLean, The Greatness of the Kingdom. It's still published. It's still accessible. It's very inexpensive. The Greatness of the Kingdom by Alva J. McLean. I tell my students, you ought to read that book every five years. Hmm. It will walk you through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and it will put the whole Bible together in a way you've never seen before. More recently, a book was written by Dr. Vlack in, uh, at the Master's Seminary, I believe. Um, he Will Reign Forever. He bases his view off of McLean. A lot of McLean is echoed in Vlack's book. Uh, Generally speaking, both of those books or either of those books would be great books for anyone to read. Awesome. We'll include those in the show notes. That's very helpful. Well, thank you listeners for listening to the Sound Words podcast. Again, follow or subscribe to our channel to help us reach more people with biblical content. Pastor Jesse, any last words to close? As always, the final word goes to God in his word. In 2 Timothy 1.13, where Paul says to Timothy, retain the standard of sound words, which you've heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Thanks for listening.